Okay, good morning and welcome to our webinar, Preparing a Scope Letter and Submitting Your Bid. Like I said, my name is James Forrest. I'm the Program Coordinator for NorCal PTAC. I'll talk about what NorCal PTAC is in just a minute. And this is Ed Duarte, who will be giving the main presentation today. Ed is our Construction and Public Works Specialist with NorCal PTAC, and he is quite an expert in the field. You're in great hands with him. I'm going to hand it over to him, but first I want to talk about NorCal PTAC. That is the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Yes, that is a mouthful, so NorCal PTAC is a much pithier solution to that. Uh, we are hosted by the Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation. We are located, that primary office is located up in Arcata, California. If you could see that red star on the map there, that is us up in Humboldt County. And in 2020, our clients won more than $314 million um, as a result of our help, nearly twi twice as much as we did in 2019. Um, how do we do this? We do it with three basic core services, one of which you're already tapping into just by being here, and that's the resources and training. But the bread and butter of what we do is one-on-one -on -one counseling. So procurement specialists such as Ed can meet with you uh, directly if you become a client, can meet with you via your phone, email, Zoom, sometimes in person, especially in the Bay Area in normal times. Um, they can, and they can go over just about any topic related to government contracting that we can think of. So um, registrations, getting your DUNS number, cage code, uh, marketplace research, how to prepare uh, your bid, your scope letter. Obviously, we're going over that today. Um, so if, if it's related to government contracting, we even do SBIR grant help. Um, not most grants we don't work with, but the SBIR is, is a very specific kind of one. Um, but the one on one counseling can cover quite a lot of fields. So it's definitely a good thing to apply for if you'd like that one on one help with your specific situation. Um, if you are a client of ours, and I'll talk about how to sign up in, in a second, if you are a client, you can also get set up with a custom bid matching profile. This is pretty cool. Uh, it, basically what it does is you work out some criteria with your procurement specialist, put it in the system, and then every morning you check your email and you have a list of opportunities that fit the criteria you put in the system. So it's a good way to stay on top of what's out there that you may wanna bid on um, so you can get ahead of the, the competition. The other thing, as you know, because you're here today that we do is uh, we provide resources and trainings. So in the past year or so, that has meant a lot of webinars. Um, we've got a lot more webinars coming up. I'll go over some of the upcoming ones at the end of the presentation. Um, these are free to join for everyone from anywhere. Doesn't matter if you're in Bangladesh, in California, uh, if you're a small business owner or you're just getting started. Uh, those are free for everybody. Um, but if you would like to sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling and the custom bid matching, um, you do have to be a client, which means you have to submit an application. And in order to be eligible for client uh, services for NorCal PTAC, your business should have a primary location in one of these counties on the map on the right that we've highlighted in green. If you are outside of that service area, um, don't stress out about that. There's actually a bunch of PTACs across the country. In fact, we're one of 94 PTACs. So uh, it, you can look up your own local PTAC. You can see, find a local PTAC at aptac-us.org slash find a PTAC. Um, and it has a list of all the different states and counties so you can go ahead and look there. If you want to sign up for us, we are norcalptech.org. Click on the red apply now button on the top to get started. Um, in addition to being located in our service area, you should also have an, an established business, you know, at least set up. Um, and you should be interested in government contracting, ready to hit the, hit the road running. So uh, we look forward to seeing some of your applications. We would love to work with you. And um, I'm going to go ahead and transition over to handing things over to Ed Duarte. Um, as I mentioned, he's quite the expert. He's going to talk a little bit about his experience, and then we're going to get going. Thank you so much, Ed. Appreciate it. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Uh, how does it feel to be free? After a year and a half of COVID lockdowns, uh, the governor has said that we can open our businesses without masks. Uh, of course, <clears throat> with government, there's always a caveat. So be sure you are current with what the rules are. I think uh, in, from a broad standpoint, if you've got more than say five employees and you have a, an office or a warehouse that the public has access to, um, 
you have to wear masks inside, but at least they've uh, opened up and let us uh, get back on with our work. I'm a retired uh, general contractor. My background is civil engineering and construction management. Uh, our family firm has been in business since 1950 and actively bidding and building public works since 1958. In uh, 1986, I moved the company to the Bay Area and uh, rebranded it as Aztec Constructors. And um, we've been fortunate to uh, have a good run. The company is still in business uh, with uh, family members now uh, taking over after I retired. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, practices on scope letters and submitting your bids for public works. The clients that uh, come over to, to uh, NorCal PTAC, they always, uh, the ones that I, I wind up assisting are the construction contractors. That's why my workshops are tailored to uh, licensed construction contracting companies both subcontractors and general contractors. And what I want to talk about today is the uh, protocol and the procedures and the industry practice that the public works contracting industry practices in putting together bids for public agencies like Caltrans, uh, BART, uh, County of Santa Clara, City of Santa Ramon, et cetera. It's, it is a set process that is essentially 99% the same for any public agency who wants to put out a contract and request, sub, uh, request bids uh, to uh, build that contract. So, as you can see in the objectives, I'm going to be talking about understanding the bid and price, pricing process, the typical bid proposal format for both primes and subs, an overview on the basic protocol of submitting a sub bid, and uh, some tips on how to develop a professional and credible scope letter. Now, I say down at the bottom that the, the workshop is designed for construction subcontractors. Now, the reason I say that is this. If you are practicing as a general contractor, you have an A or a B license, and you want to submit a bid to any California Public Works Agency, anyone, your, that process is governed by the California Public Contract Code. And it says that in addition to having to be licensed and have the right insurance, you have to be bondable. So if you're listening to this workshop and you're a general contractor and you have been bidding on public works, then by logic, I know that you must have performance and payment bonding capacity and you probably are already familiar with how the process works. It's the subcontractors that quite often miss the boat, if you will, in understanding exactly how it works. So that's why my comments today are gonna to be primarily directed to the subcontracting community. But for those of you who do wanna be bidding as general contractors, um, these are the things that would apply the basic requirements, the right license, whether it's A, B, or a specialty C category for a sub, you have to be registered with the Department of Industrial Relations and you're assigned a DIR number. That costs $400 a year. And it essentially, it's paying for the privilege of bidding on public works. Registering and getting a DIR number does not get you any work whatsoever. It merely allows you to bid on the work. And if you 
are the low bidder or, or your subcontract price is accepted, you must be registered before that job is uh, starts construction. You have to have all, all the proper insurance coverage, workers' comp, liability. Uh, you have to pay prevailing wages to every worker. Uh, and in California, prevailing wages is loosely defined as a union scale. So anywhere in California that there's a public works con construction contract underway, be assured that all the workers there are required to be paid union scale as applicable to that geographical area. You have to comply with apprenticeship regulations. In California, the apprenticeship uh, requirement is that for every five journey persons on the job site, you need one apprentice. So 20% of the hours that are that are uh, spent on a project, they must be at, uh, apprentices that that are paid for those twenty that twenty percent. The standard pay procedure is a lot different than the private sector, in that you only get paid once a month. You get thirty day uh, once every thirty days in arrears, which means that you work a month. You submit a bill and the state or the county or the city or the water district, they have 30 days in which to pay you. So you essentially are carrying job, job site costs for 45 to 60 days. And there are more than a couple of agencies out there who do not have their act together and they don't pay very promptly. And or the general contractor doesn't pay very promptly. So if you can't carry costs for at least 90 days, you're gonna have trouble on your first three or four jobs. Any bid proposal that the co prime contractor submits is always done on the owner's bid form. We don't write the contracts. We don't have any say so on, on uh, the bid proposal format whatever that agency puts out on the street as the contract bid documents, that's what the prime has to fill out. And finally, if you are bidding as a prime, all project over 25,000 will be required to be fully bonded. And I'm not talking about your license bond that has $15,000 coverage. Next slide, please. General conditions that you will find in every set of contract documents. Uh, there's always an invitation to bid, information to contractors, which tells us the date, time, and place where the job is gonna be bid and when the bid is due, what time it's due. Um, it'll, of course, re repeat the bonding requirements. The bid proposal form is always included in the bid documents. And I say that, I put it in red bold, to highlight the fact that you subcontractors, you need to take a look at that form so that you understand how the prime has to submit their bid. If it's a cost breakdown format, such as individual bid items like Caltrans and most roadway projects, under heavy civil projects, they'll have a list of bid items that all have to be priced individually, including your, your supervision, your profit and your overhead. So if you're bidding as a sub and you submit a one lump sum price for electrical work on a Caltrans or county roadway job, probably the, the, the general contractor is not even gonna take the time to look at your price because you haven't submitted your price in the right format. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. There'll be a description of the work, the insurance requirements. Again, the, the um, requirement for the DIR registration. If there's a project labor agreement, it means that every single worker on the site will have to be 
uh, become a member of a union. Uh, they'll also uh, stipulate if there's any BB Weeby DBE requirements, if any. They always will tell you the contract completion time, how much, you know, what date it has to be completed, or how many working days or how many calendar days are, are, uh, set us, are allowed in the contract for the prime to complete the project. And if it's not done on that date, liquidated damages start, which is what you and I used to call penalties. So if you don't finish on time and you don't have any excusable delay, uh, uh, any excused delays, then the owner can assess you whatever the LD amount is per day until the job is complete. It will also always tell you what type of schedule is required, a CPM. It stands for critical path method, which is a computer generated timeline. Uh, the two most popular are uh, Primavera P6 and um, or Microsoft Project. It'll tell you about the submittal requirements, the number of copies, the turnaround time. It'll out, it will detail in a very explicit detail what are the change order procedures for any, any change order work for cost backup requirements, how much the markups are, disputes. Uh, let me just say that about change orders. Uh, there's a myth out there that, um, that uh, General contractors love to get a change order. Any contractor wants to get a change order on a public works job. Well, I, I'll tell you, go out and talk to any prime contractor or any subcontractor who has experience in the public sector. And I'm pretty sure they're all gonna tell you the same thing. They'd be very happy if there were no change orders because right off the bat, the markup that is allowed on change order work is specified in the contract documents. And trust me, the markups that they allow for change order work are ridiculous. They don't, they barely cover your cost. So if you think you're gonna be getting a lot of change orders on public works jobs and make a killing, think again. Uh, it only happens on the massive jobs where the owner screws things up. And a good example of that is the, the high-speed rail but we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, there'll be a weather day allowance policy, pay application procedure. There's a retention policy. Every progress payment that you get will have 5% deducted. It's withheld, it's retained. And you get that 5% retention when the job is finished. So they hold a 5% retention on the progress payments to the prime contractor. So on a flow down clause, which is typical, uh, we will hold the 5% from any progress payment to the subcontractors. They'll outline the safety program requirements and a big deal was made of that over COVID. Uh, there's extra expense involved. Uh, under any contracts being awarded right now, yeah, I can guarantee you that COVID has been built into it. So uh, paying for masks, and uh, training sessions and uh, hand sanitation stations. Um, all that had better be in your bid because you're not gonna get any extra for that. The SWIPI plan, which is stormwater uh, uh, prevention uh, and control. Uh, there's the QAQC, quality control materials testing requirements and uh, project closeout procedures. All of these, bullet points are discussed at a, at a kickoff meeting, and but they are all written in the specifications. None of this is verbal. It's all written down. The problem with new contractors and, and inexperienced contractors on public works is that they don't take the time to read the manual, the project manual, the contract bid document, it's all in there. And um, those of you who have attended my workshops, you know, I'm, 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 I always use the phrase, it's in the book. If it's in the book, we are liable for it. We have to comply. If it's not in the book, then we can talk. We can debate something. 
or we can contest something. But if it's in the specifications or the general conditions as published when the job is put out to bid, there is no argument. Next slide, please. So I hear in all of my workshops all the time, well, I don't know how to find these jobs. I don't know. Uh, I get a no, uh, I, I, sometimes I get an email from a general contractor and they want me to, they want me to uh, have a price ready the next day. Well, the problem is that inexperienced subcontractors truly don't know how the public works process, uh, advertising goes. And that's why you need to do a couple of things to uh, make it easier for yourself. Every single agency that I know of that puts out any amount of construction work contracts for public bid, they all have websites. I mean, that's where we're at. It's the internet. It's the age of, of the internet. So if you go to the Caltrans website or the BART website or City of San Ramon website or Stanislaw County website, they all have tabs that will say something like doing business, projects, public works, whatever. Go to those websites and take a look and see if they've got any jobs out for bid. If they do, they will be posting on their, on their website the date, time, and all of that information that I talked about in the information to bid. And it'll give you an idea of, do you even want to take a look at that job? This is a big deal because once you get certified as a small business or a disadvantaged business, and you get on a list of DBEs, that d list goes out and is accessible by every major general contractor doing business with public works agencies. And what are they gonna do with that list? They're gonna blast email all of you, every job that they're bidding, you're gonna be buried in emails asking you to bid on jobs that you haven't got a clue. And normally you won't get the two weeks lead time, which you should have in order to put a, a, a competitive bid together. So what I'm getting at is you need to help yourself by looking at these websites and trying to find projects on your own. That way you can take a look at the description and the engineer's estimate and it'll give you a rough idea. Is this something I want to bid on? For example, if you're an electrical subcontractor and you're taking a look, you want to, you want to bid on a public works job. I don't know about you, but if you start looking at jobs that are 50, 100 million or bigger, the chances are that you can't handle that electrical work. And unless it's really a mega project like Caltrain or, or uh, the high speed rail or one of these $100 million Caltrans projects, unless it's something that big, the probability that the prime is going to be willing to sub the electrical out, electrical work to two electrical contractors is next to nil. The risk is too great. So it, it, it behooves you, it, it's to your advantage to pick on jobs that you know you can handle. And, 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 and you do that by saying, well, what's the biggest subcontract I can handle? I could do a $100,000 electrical job. I can do a $75,000 concrete job. I can do a $200,000 HVAC job. Whatever your skill is, whatever your trade is, and whatever your capacity is, you don't want to overstate it because once you get signed up by a prime contractor, they're going to expect you to do exactly whatever's in that book. And if you haven't got the horsepower and the finances to build that project in the 
in the window of time that they are going to dictate, you've bit off more than you can chew. And that's the last thing in the world you want to do. So again, number three, review that bid form. If it's a lump sum bid, it makes everybody's uh, life a whole lot easier, especially for us primes. We don't have to do an extensive cost breakdown ahead of time, which is what a unit price bid job does. So take a look at the list of primes, plan to bid a job, prepare your scope letter, decide what you're gonna bid upon, send up a bidding primes your unpriced scope letter. Sending that letter two or three days ahead of time is the right way to do it. And I'm gonna tell you why in a minute. Start working on your estimate and then on bid day morning, send your priced out scope letter. Next slide, please. So what, 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 what's the problem with scope letters? Well, every prime contractor will tell you what I'm gonna tell you, which is what I saw in my 55 years in the business and we only built, uh, our company only bid as a prime, is that it was unbelievable how many subcontractors don't read the specs. So, so it starts by putting together a coherent, competitive, professional scope letter that catches my attention. And let me tell you, it, as a prime contractor, we need to receive, evaluate, track, and post a multitude of sub-bid information while we're putting our final numbers together. Our, our Excel spreadsheets get quite large. I always, in many of my workshops, I always refer to a job we bid about 10 years ago, a, a new gymnasium for Dublin Unified School District. There was, it was a time when there was a, a very competitive uh, environment there were a lot of generals bidding the job. We got over 300 scope letters and we have to read them and compare apples to apples for the electrical, apples to apples for the dirt work, apples to apples for the concrete and so forth. So if, if you feel that your bids are being ignored or second class status or be, even being shopped around, there's a lot of things that you can do to to mitigate that, and I'm, gonna, and, and I'm gonna show you some worst practices that'll guarantee your bid will never be considered. Remember, over 95% of all sub bids are submitted in the last hour before bid time. Next. Your scope letter should be on your letterhead with all the information as shown on the sample. We're gonna have, it's just, we only have four little, uh, sample documents that you'll be able to take a look at. We'll talk about them in just a minute. So preparing your scope letter, your pricing format as the same as the primes is the professional way to submit your bid. If you follow this protocol, it will ensure you receive fair consideration and evaluation of your proposal. Because what it does, it immediately tells me, here is a sub who has read the specs who knows what the bid form is. And that means they probably understand the entire process. I'm gonna take a look at their scope of work and see if I have any questions. And I, if I do, I'm gonna give them a call. Now we've got dialogue. Now we have communication between a prime and a sub. If, if that scope letter is strictly amateurish and put together incorrectly, I don't have time to go with that. I just don't. Next slide. Next slide. So best practices. Well, obviously start your own estimate early. Do your pre-bid job walk, your quantity takeoffs, develop your spreadsheet at least a week before the project bids. Format your spreadsheet to mimic the the Prime's bid form as required by the owner. Send out your own request for, from your suppliers and your sub-subs, your second tier subs who uh, you're gonna need pricing for in order to put your entire subcontract price together. And then again, send your unpriced scope letter 
to the breeding that you find. I, I emphasize that because when you send your scope letter to me two or three days early, aside from all the positives that I just mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, you are establishing credibility. And you could very well help me out. There might be a question, uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, on, a, on a remodel, the electrical work will be new construction and probably some old demolition, for example, electrical demolition. And I get a scope letter from the electrician that says, I, uh, I exclude electrical demo and I exclude the standby generator. So because I need to get that electrical demo included, I can either do it with my people or I can do it with a sub. And it's probably more efficient if I have the sub do it, the electrical sub do it. Same thing with the generator. Maybe uh, I'll buy the generator, but I want the electrician to hook it up. So I'll give this guy a call and we'll discuss those two exclusions and possibly he'll amend his scope and will include the electrical demo and will add in the installation of the generator, the hookup of the generator. So that all came about because he gave me a very credible looking scope letter, which caught my attention because there was a couple of key items of work that need to be addressed. One way or another, I had to have those two items covered in my spreadsheet, either through a sub or with my own forces. So this, this uh, unpriced scope letter two or three days early, it generates interest and it usually results in generating communication. And that's what you subcontractors need to develop in order to make sure that the prime contractors are willing to look at your number. Notwithstanding the fact, of course, you need to be the low bidder. That's, we all need to be the low bidder. That's, that's the public contract code. Next slide, please. So as you're putting your letter together, be as clear and concise as possible. Be sure to structure your pricing to match the format as the bids prime proposal. Be sure to reference the spec section that applies to your work always include all applicable taxes and freight. Never exclude that because somebody's got to pay for it and it's not going to be me or as a prime for your material, your equipment. So you need to include all that. You need to acknowledge all the denims. Key, big eye, big deal. It's a very big deal. Um, if you have any knowledge of the construction industry at all, you know what an addendum is. It's a bulletin or a memo that comes out during the bidding time period and it updates the bid requirements and the scope of work. And it will add in work or it'll delete work or it will clarify. And those addendums are issued numerically, addendum number one, number two, number three, et cetera. Part of the public contract code tells me as a prime that I have to put on my bid proposal form, there'll be a spot there for me to fill in that says, I acknowledge that I have received, seen and, and read all one, two or three addendum. I'm ever, however many addendums are issued prior to bid time. So if I have to turn that in, Likewise, if you as a subcontractor, you, you on your scope letter, you need to acknowledge that you've seen all the addendums because those addendums could very well affect your scope of work. So acknowledgement of addendums is grounds for disqualifying a bid for a prime. And if a sub doesn't acknowledge all addendums, 
the prime gets the job, lists that subcontractor, and we go to work, and then you come on the site and say, and I say, well, where's, where's the uh, epoxy paint for the generator room? And then you say, oh, well, I don't, I don't have that. I don't, I don't have it included. And I said, it's on addendum number three. Well, yeah, now we've got a, now we have a conflict. So acknowledgement of addendums is a big deal. If there's any delivery restraints that could affect the schedule on your equipment, that's going to be part of your scope. Let me know. Let me know. Identify any unloading requirements. Uh, rebar subcontractors, typically, they will uh, furnish the rebar job site trucks, FOB job site trucks, which means they do not unload them, and they shouldn't. Uh, for those of you who, who know rebar, you know that a 20-foot or a 30-foot long piece of number four, number five, number six rebar, a bundle of those, that's heavy. It takes a crane. So uh, if your equipment needs to be unloaded and you're not going to have a, a, a forklift, if you don't include a forklift with your, with your uh, delivery, then let me know so I can make sure that there's equipment there to unload it. If appropriate, offer alternate pricing, but for a partial scope, but be very clear on that. That can be easily taken care of if I see your scope letter a couple of days before the time that the bid is due. And lastly, state how long your price is good for. It's another problem and it's a big deal right now, especially. And this comes up in a, in a cycle. It happens all the time. Uh, when there's copper shortages, the electricians say my price is good for 30 days. Well, here's the problem, folks. Every public works prime bid proposal will have a paragraph that says the prime guarantees their price for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. Whatever is on that bid proposal form, that's what the prime has to guarantee. The fact that the prices go up during that interim period is irrelevant and it's just too bad. We do not get change orders for increase of cost of materials or equipment. So if you send me a scope letter that says, I'll pick on the electricians again, I say, uh, you're going to furnish all the electrical work and you're going to furnish the generator. But you've been told by Kohler that the generator price is only good for 30 days. However, the bid proposal form says we've got to hold our price for 90 days. And by the way, this happens more often than I care to remember. So what happens if that price goes up? I'm SOL, all right? It's too bad. So how do we handle that? Well, we build in a cushion. One way is talk to Kohler, talk to the factory rep, you as an electrician, talk to them and say, well, okay, how much of the price is gonna go up? Well, they're gonna go up uh, probably no more than three, 4%, maybe 5%. Well, then you know what? You better put 5% cushion in your price because if it does go up, you're covered. If it doesn't go up, well, guess what? You just got a little bonus. Or if you want to gamble and you don't put a cushion in and the price does not go up, you're home free. If it does go up, you just took a hit. Remember folks, this is construction. It's public works contracting, and it's high risk. It's high risk. There are no guarantees for us. All the guarantees are in favor of the owner. Next slide, please. So after you send that thing unpriced, call the estimator, ask if they received your scope. Ask if they have any questions. 
If you have questions about the bid, now's the time to ask. Don't be calling me on bid day because we've got hundreds of scope letters that we're looking at on bid day and we don't talk to subs on bid day. Request that they give you bid results for your trade after the bids are open and mention to them, you're gonna send them a tally sheet. So that all they have to do is fill in the numbers. That can be something as simple as a header that says concrete work, division four, uh, division uh, three rather. Um, and then get, give them four blank lines and put your bid in there in, the, in this email you send to them. When they open the bids, they can fill in the numbers of the other concrete contractors and they can send it back to you after the bids are open. Now you have a, a uh, critique. Now you, you see where you stood and you see why you got the job or why you didn't get the job. If you ask that and develop a, a, uh, from a general contractor that you've developed a relationship with, most of the time they will be happy to give you a results tally sheet so that you can see how well you did. It's a very handy tool. And again, it generates uh, relationships. Next slide. Okay, let's take a look at our little documents, James. First one would be a, a, the sample. All right. As you all know, you'll get copies of these slides and you get copies of these documents. This is not a form for you to make up in this format exactly, because the scope letter has got to be on your letterhead. What I tried to show here are the points of information that absolutely need to be included on your scope letter. So the usual on the header is name, address, phone number, are you union or non-union, your DIR number, your phone, email, license number, are you certified as a, as a DBE, MBE, are you bondable, yes or no? And if you are bondable, what is your bonding rate? What percentage do you pay for bonds? We'll talk about that in a moment. We will be bidding on the following project, the name, location, architect, engineer, the bid date, the bid time. And if you want to put, include the contract number, putting all of this information on your scope letter, it just shows me you know how to, how to do this process. And then we'll be quoting a price for the following work, spec section number 0400, masonry, general heading description, uh, reinforced concrete masonry or concrete uh, uh, masonry units, specific scope of work, furnish and install all CMU units to form the walls of the generator room and the warehouse. Price includes rebar and, and uh, scaffolding, and we furnish and install the rebar. Or you, as a masonry contractor, maybe you will um, exclude the cost of the rebar and have the prime do that. The prime would do that through a, a rebar sub, but the installation of the rebar has got to be done by the masons. Delivery or lead time for major materials, probably not an issue with, with uh, a masonry contractor. Our to my total price, scroll down a bit, James. I include all taxes, delivery to the job site, complete installation, complete for plans and specs, exclusions, qualifications. Um, here's where we would detail uh, we will install the rebar, but we exclude the rebar. If you want us to include the rebar, add $5,800. Uh, we don't include, uh, we clean up our own work, dumpster to be provided by general, and any other such uh, exclusions and qualifications that are typical for your trade. 
And then at the bottom, we acknowledge addendums number, however we're, many were um, issued, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Okay. This format works very well. Uh, it provides all the information I need to know as a prime contractor. And it identifies you as somebody who knows what they're doing on a public works project, how to bid properly. So remember, this goes on your letterhead. Next uh, slide, please. All right, so here's a sample from uh, Jensen Landscape on the uh, Primrose School in San Jose. Here's to confirm our quotation for the above reference project per plans and specs dated as prepared by, we have a noted addendums two to five. Landscape and irrigation, a lump sum price. He includes plants, soil amendment, bark mulch, irrigation, and cleanup and 90 day maintenance. And then qualifications, if you can scroll down a little bit, James. He says, site's gotta be received at plus or minus the 10th of finished grade, which means that dirt's gotta be level and within one tenth of a foot of the correct elevation because he's gonna fill it with topsoil and his plantings. Says the bid's bit valid for 60 days. He's bidding the job a straight time, no overtime. He wants one move in. Plant material subject to availability. Shrub size, shrubs bid as size indicated on legend and not per note for sheet L form. Interesting comment. It would warrant us taking a look at that. Uh, and he gives other qualifications and then exclusions, power and hookup to the controller, the water meter, cutting, boring, coring and patching, uh, clear and grub, drainage, et cetera. So those are it says exclusions. And then on the last page, let's scroll down, James. He, uh, tells you what else he's not, not including. And that's the end of a scope letter. Clean, simple. I, I put this in here because it is a uh, good example of a well-written scope letter. Let's go to the next example. Okay, not to be picking on anybody, but these are the ones we prime contractors hate because what I have here is a price based on the, this company's materials takeoff. So at first it sounds, it's, it's protecting them. Uh, that's great, up to a point. So the scope, our proposal based on RMCA architecture, structural and architectural bid set, Drawings eight seven. Uh, they, we offer the price includes sale tax. He's a small business number so and so, and his lump sum price, and it covers the following: materials that are furnished and erected. And he lists five five items, and then materials furnished only for job site to be set by others. Uh, you know the TS connectors, uh, elevator hoist beams. Etc. That's fine, except that this is forcing me to do my own takeoff and make sure that this guy has, has um, included all applicable metals that are in his scope section, in his uh, specification. So Anytime you ask a prime contractor to check your quantity takeoff, you're not making any friends. We're all big boys and big girls. We, this is your responsibility. What I like to see is I've got materials furnished and erected complete for plans and specs. I've got materials furnished only for job site. Okay, detail those out. But as soon as you start doing very lengthy 
takeoffs and you want me to accept that and write it into your subcontract, I'm going to balk. I'm not comfortable with that. And I can tell you that example, very bitter experience. We had the very same type of thing where we were doing a fire station in Berkeley and the edge metal that formed the slab for the second floor was a lightweight gauge material that was absolutely excluded from the guy's bid proposal. We missed it and we had to pay him $14,000 to, to do it after the fact. Um, not a good way to make friends and influence people. Yeah, keep scrolling down, James, please. And this, this company has all kinds of uh, exclusions and qualifications. And I, I get it. I understand that there's a lot of subcontractors out there, there that have been taken advantage of by primes. It happens more often than I care to think about. But the bottom line is this. The prime contractor is responsible to the owner and the subcontractor is responsible to the prime. And those relationships from a legal standpoint, they have to govern how we're going to do business. So, or I don't, I, you know, I don't expect you to sign a one-sided contract. I don't expect you, uh, you sh shouldn't expect that I'm going to sign your contract because that's not how it works in this business. The sub signs the prime subcontract. It's not, it's not the reverse. Um, keep on going up, James. He says here, we're not going to honor any back charges unless notified in writing at the time and given the opportunity to correct the situation. Absolutely. That's a fair clause. I don't have a problem with that at all. We have that written into our subcontract with, that we uh, hire our subcontractors with. We give them 48 hour notice that we've got a problem pending and you've got to fix it. And if you don't, then I'm going to fix it and I'm going to back charge you. And then he's got all these exclusions. Well, it'll take me longer to read the exclusions and I have time to. So as I said, um, it's not a, it's a good example of the type of scope letter that most primes don't care for, but I understand the reason why they do it. So I included it to give you exposure to this type of, uh, of a bid proposal. All right, next sample. This one is, has the unit pricing method. For some reason, the prime, uh, the school district wanted a cost breakdown. And they're asking the prime to put on their bid form these uh, five items. How much the exterior wiring and lighting and the building cost of electrical, the fire alarm system, the security, the low voltage. So that's how uh, the bid form was to be pre presented by the prime. So that's how the sub bid it to the prime contractor. So they're going to furnish and install all materials, taxes, labor, and equipment required for Division 2600 electric construction, the fire alarm, the telephone, et cetera, et cetera. Any electrical work shown on any drawing or stated in any other spec division not listed in this scope is not included. Well, that's a CYA clause, which most of the time won't cause any heartache, but uh, in the mechanical and electrical sheets, quite often the wiring for the, um, for the control systems might not be listed on the electrical sheet. It might show up on the mechanical sheet. And if the electrician is not looking at any M sheets and is only looking at E sheets, then 
that wiring might be missed. And again, we've got a gap and that doesn't make for good relationships. So that's a question that I would ask this electrician if I got this scope letter early, because why do I ask that? Just through plain experience over the years, thousands of work of bids we put together, I've had that problem come up where the electrical circuitry for the controllers, for the control system on, on mechanical equipment is shown only on the mechanical sheets and it's not shown on the electrical sheets. Therefore, the electrician says, oh, I don't have it. And we all know that HVAC subcontractors do not do electrical work. They only do tie-in, they only do hookup. So there we are, another problem. Uh, uh, scroll down, please, Jean. So he acknowledges addendums one through five. He, uh, they apparently asked for uh, an hourly rate, including markup. Um, he includes submittals, he includes a warranty, he includes cleaning cleanup to the dumpster provided by others. He excludes temperature control wiring, conduit, power controls for mechanical equipment, not shown on the drawings in our scope low voltage unless it's included in the scope, independent testing, depth demolition, and of course, no overtime, and temporary power. He doesn't include any of that. So, <clears throat> and at the bottom, he says this quotation is valid for 30 days from the date. So there you have, uh, what, three examples of typical sub bids that are both uh, good, not so good, excellent. But the important thing is they are relevant. That's the way you need to do yours or something similar. So again, referring back to my comment, when you send in a scope letter that's prepared in an industry format and the correct pricing set up that the prime has to follow and your exclusions are typical for your industry, then I know that I'm looking at a scope letter from a seasoned or experienced subcontractor. And I'm gonna take a look at your number. And if, you're, if you are the low bidder, I'm gonna use your number and I'm gonna list you on my bid proposal because I'm required to. Any, any subcontract that I intend to issue, if I'm awarded the project, any subcontract, subcontract in excess of one half of 1% of my total bid, I have to show that subcontractor's name, license number, and in many cases, I even have to put in the amount of their subcontract. So that's your protection if you are the low sub. Let's go back to the slides, James. So worst practices, don't bid the alternate items unless they're approved by an A&E firm. What do I mean by that? Uh, what I'm talking about is alternate equipment or materials that are not in the specifications. Because when you look at a, a, a specification, let's go to a, a HVAC unit. They'll say we'll accept uh, we'll accept uh, carrier and we'll accept train. No other HV, HVAC units are acceptable, which means they don't want Lennox. All right. So if you're a mechanical sub, don't give me a bid where you intend to furnish Linux units because they're not gonna be approved. Don't include a detailed quantities takeoff sheet. I, I talked talk about that. Don't exclude taxes and freight. Don't expect that you're gonna dictate any payment terms, okay? And that includes retention. 
I can always tell a green subcontractor when they start saying, we don't, ex we don't accept retention and payments are due within two days, uh, two weeks after submittal of invoice uh, and when we start charging interest. Well, that ain't gonna happen, folks. You get paid when I get paid. Whenever I get the check from the owner, I have five business days in which to pay you. That's the law. That's the public contract law. Don't make a long, long list of exclusions that are not industry standard for your type of work. Don't ask for any upfront money. There are no deposits in public works, okay? On the contrary, they make us fund the job for at least two months, sometimes three months. And don't wait until 15 minutes before bids are due to submit your price. If you do that, you're pretty much guaranteed you're, we're not, not gonna look at your number. Don't have the time. Remember, we're still putting the spreadsheet together at 10 minutes, and in many cases, at five minutes till the due hour. And we have our bid runner on a cell phone at the lobby of the agency with a clipboard filling out uh, our bid proposal. Yeah, I know there, there are a lot of agencies starting to, to uh, move towards uh, electronic bidding. Well, it's not completely here yet, but if you wait until 15 minutes before the bids are due, uh, you might as well dump it in the trash. And again, let's talk early. Don't wait until bid day to ask questions. Next. So on bid day, finalize, send it, to, send it out to the primes 45 to 60 minutes early. The next day, contact the low bidder and request results for your work. If they used your number and listed you, send a little short, simple note. Hey, congrats. See, you got the, the new uh, child care center. Uh, thanks for listing me. And then we'll be, they'll be talking to you later because they have to get the job awarded. Just because they're low doesn't mean they, are, they have the job. And you can always follow the owner's website because they have to post the bid results and some of them even post the subcontract list. Next. So we crammed a lot into an hour. Um, for those of you who know me or have done some, uh, attended some of my workshops, you might have even seen this before, but a refresher never hurts. So at this point in time, I hope there are some questions. And if so, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, please do enter questions into the Q&A. Um, we're gonna use the Q&A for uh, questions rather than the chat. Um, it is 11.03 now, so if anyone has to leave, I just want to um, uh, ask you kindly if you would fill out the satisfaction survey as you exit. Um, I'll also send out a link to that later today once I provide the slides and the video and then all of the handouts, the score handouts as well. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. Those will be provided to everybody. Um, but please do enter any questions you have in the Q&A right now. Um, and I will go over a couple upcoming events we have. We've got two events with the California Department of General Services, um, or the OSDS. Uh, we've got the How to Do Business with the State of California, which can be an introduction. And then I'm certified, now what? Um, how to proceed once you get certified. Um, so we've got some nice presenters there from the California state government. That is on the 13th and the 14th, Tuesday and Wednesday. They're both at 10 a.m. So go ahead and sign up for those if you're interested in doing business with the state. And then we've got this whole matchmaker thing we've been working uh, pretty hard on. It's happening on July 20th. You can see down there at the bottom, Tuesday, July 20th. It's an all-day event, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., totally free. Uh, you can sign up, uh, register, enter your business's information, and then we have a computer uh, platform that uh, pairs you with different agencies from federal, state, local, even prime contractor uh, agencies um, who will uh, be looking for uh, suppliers to, to network with. So you'll, you can have the opportunity to have all these meetings, which is pretty great. We also have a number of uh, prep webinars designed for attendees. Those who are most excited can join and learn how to make the best 
out of the matchmaker experience. So do check, take a look at those July 6th, 7th, 8th, and 15th, um, all sorts of topics there. So these are all free to join. I highly recommend you check them out. Um, they will also be posted on our website along with all of our other web uh, webinars. So we, we upload them all to YouTube and then we make them available to everyone. So we wanna get the word out there as much as possible. Once again, you can sign up for NorCal PTAC at our website and that's also where you can find all these webinars. Okay, we have some time for questions. Um, as I said, it's 11.05 now. If folks have to get out of here, that's fine. Um, this is being recorded, but if you'd like to put in some questions, please do enter them in the Q&A. I see a couple here. Ed, in the past, you've just uh, read them aloud and handled handle them yourself. Do you want to do that or do you want me to MC? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll do it. That's fine. Great. Okay, the first question is from Suzanne. Are there opportunities as a subcontractor for live scan, fingerprinting, or notary services? Um, not as a subcontractor. That's more really like a professional service. And uh, quite honestly, I can't, I really can't see where your service would um, be applicable to the construction industry. Um, for example, with our firm, we don't do fingerprinting, but we do uh, background checks and we, uh, we sub that out with a, 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 to a, uh, we have an industry association that provides uh, background checks for us for a fee. And notary services, you'll find that most general contractors uh, wind up uh, paying to have their own in-house notar notaries because we have so many documents that have to be notarized nowadays. Um, we have two notaries in our office and, and we have a, and we're not a large company, we're a medium-sized company. So um, I think uh, I would suggest that maybe you talk to one of our other counselors, but the uh, Department of General Services, DGS, uh, they they can request this type of service and there might be an opportunity there. <clears throat> what is the acronym uh, for Winnie? What is the acronym SWPPI? It's actually, I, I did it wrong. It's uh, S-W-P-P. It's, it's Storm Water Pollution Con Prevention. Uh, it, it's a program, it's erosion control. Every job site, every public works job site, every job site, not private as well, you have to have a, a, a pollution prevention plan that the, the erosion, the drainage from your job site can't go into the gutter and into the storm drains without going through a filter system. So there's, it's, a, it's another requirement for good old uh, environmentally correct, California, it's added about $10,000 to $15,000 to every construction project, depending on the size of the project. Uh, we've participated in some jobs where the SWPI program, it requires an engineer to design it. Uh, there's a separate drawing for it. There's separate fees, and then you pay to have someone monitor it. Um, we've seen SWPI programs that uh, cost upwards of fifty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars, and this is all to monitor the drainage water that comes from any rainfall uh, draining off your site. The fact that we hardly get any rainfall doesn't <coughs> mitigate that requirement. You still have to put up all the snow fencing. Those, those uh, you've seen those plastic fence that looks like netting. Uh, and the round uh, fiber rolls that uh, that are lined al along the curb and gutter, and you surround every drain inlet. That's what a SWEPI program is. Giovanna says, can you talk a little more on the bond? Other than the bond, we need to have for our license. You mentioned we need to have. What's the name of this bond? Okay. I do a separate work up, workshop on that because it's a big deal. It's, uh, we're talking about performance and payment bonding. It's a line of bonding credit that you will get from a surety company based on your financial uh, stability and solvency and net worth and the value of your assets. It's like a line of credit on steroids 
because what, what you're doing is you're, when you, this is only for the prime contractor. When, when you, as a prime, turn your bid into city of Berkeley for a $100,000 bid, you give them a $100,000 bond. And that bond says that you will finish the work per plans and specs for the $100,000 and no more. That you, you, They'll never have to pay you any more than that, assuming there's no change orders, all right? But halfway through the job, you go belly up. They call your bonding company and the bonding company comes in and takes over the project and um, finishes the work in whatever manner they choose. They can bring another general in, they can take over your, your subs, they can take over your equipment, they can uh, bring in new subs. It doesn't matter. The, the bonding company has absolute carte blanche on how to finish the job for you. You have defaulted and your bonding company is now in charge. When and the day they start, they start a tab and they're not interested in saving any money. They just, they just need to get the job done. So I said, you got, you finished, you uh, went belly up. Let's say you went through halfway through, you got $50,000 payment and there's $50,000 left in the contract, but you're out of business. So they finish the job. And when they tally up the expense to finish the job, it's $75,000. Well, they're only gonna collect 50 from the city. So they're $25,000 short. You have to bank that up. Well, I'm bankrupt. Well, you, have, you signed an indemnification agreement. We all have, every prime has done this. Every prime has signed an indemnification agreement that says we shall keep the surety whole. All right, so they go after my assets. They take over my house, my 401k, my equipment, my office building, whatever assets they need to liquidate to get another 25 grand. That's how it works. So you can see that getting qualified for bonding, uh, three years tax returns, three years CPA prepared financial statement, uh, um, money in the bank, line of credit. It takes a lot to get bonding. And it doesn't mean that you can't get it. It just, it's a process. So that's the type of bonding that every prime has to have on every single public works contract where you're bidding as a prime. Uh, Ken says, is there a different type of scope for, of work for a job with solar and HVAC. Um, I, I think what you mean is there, if you're bidding solar only, yeah, there'll be a specification on the solar. If you're bidding HVAC, there'll be a spe separate specification for the HVAC. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yeah. I mean, it's two different types of work. So um, if you want to type in a little more, if I can, answer, I'll be happy to answer. Is a different format. Um, well, and that, that, that goes back to, <coughs> James, you want to answer the question? Um, no, no, no expertise Sorry. here. <laughs> okay. Um, is there a different format? Well, no. I mean, if if you're gonna if you're gonna bid a solar project to me, I'm assuming you're gonna say I'll do all the solar work for lump sum dollars, and then you need to identify what it is you're providing. Remember, on a private job, you you can you can put down all of the, you are dictating what you are bidding on. You're, you're defining your scope. On a public works job, the scope is defined in the contract documents. We as contractors 
don't have one word to say about what's in the plans and specs, except that whatever's in the plans and specs, that will, is what we have to provide. So if, if, if it's a school job and, and they have solar on there, I guarantee you there's gonna be a very a detailed spec section on the solar, just like there is a spec section on the HVAC. Does that answer your question? Below, he specifies production guarantees and warranties, et cetera. And he said, yes, that answered his question. So there's one from Giovanna there, you see? I talked about hers already. Okay. All right, then that should be it. I believe that we've wrapped up the questions. Um, it is 1116 now. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, if you could look after that email later today, we'll have a satisfaction survey. We'd love if you fill it out. It doesn't take long and you can do it anonymously. Um, thanks uh, to Ed for doing all the research and work, uh, legwork, putting in this presentation for lending your expertise. And again, thanks to everyone for joining and we hope to see you at future webinars. Um, Take care, right. everybody. Good luck. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.